Okay, so thank you all for joining us. Appreciate you braving the snow this morning and coming in to join us for Westy. And we have a few folks online. Um, we have our, our speaker is coming in, um, speaking to us from Kansas today, Dr. Mark Apley uh, with Kansas um, State University. And he work, he's, a, he's a veterinarian and he works there in their College of Veterinary Medicine. So I asked him specifically today to speak about um, effective antibiotic use in cattle and in response to some of the questions there are so many things on the market. What do we use? How do we make those decisions? So he's gonna share some information with us today. The best way to ask questions is gonna be, I think, to wait till the end perhaps. And if, if you're up here near the computer, he'll be able to hear you quite well, or um, be able to type them into the chat and we can certainly make time for that. And then following that, Dr. Shelby Rosasco is gonna be talking to us about um, EPDs and some genetics. So thank you all. Uh, if you need your private applicator license renewed this year, there's a list of the dates um, that we're doing those workshops. And in the back, you'll see some books uh, on soils, cover crops, um, farm communication, a few different things. And there's some red books back there. So please take anything you need. And I will turn it over to Dr. Apley. Get this out of the way so you don't have to look at that. There you go, sir. It's all you. All right, I should be unmuted there. You sound got great. My screen showing. Yep, sounds great. All right. Well, as I understand it, we've got an hour slot of time here to talk about antibiotics and food animals, and specifically cattle up in your neck of the woods. Uh, give you a little bit about myself. I'm a second generation veterinarian. Grew up in a veterinary practice in uh, central Kansas, down around Larned, and. Uh, practice with my dad for a couple of years, uh, returned for my PhD in clinical pharmacology and physiology, and then uh, got boarded, spent about four years in a contract research and feedlot consulting practice, and then some time at Iowa State. Now I've been back at Kansas State 16 years this, uh, this summer where I teach in the veterinary program here. And antibiotics is, was one of the reasons, the main reason I went back to uh, do a PhD program and get board certified, uh, real interest in antibiotics and how they work. And so over the years, I've put together some thoughts on how you even talk about it, uh, how you even understand what makes one antibiotic better or uh, a good choice. And the spoiler for the end is I'm not making recommendations here today on I'd use this antibiotic first and this one second and that one third because I am completely devoid of information on your specific situation and your veterinarian is the best one to talk that over with you. But I do have a lot of pointers on things that can mislead us in conclusions that I've uh, put together over the years. And so this, I was tickled to get this invitation because it caused me to uh, put together these thoughts really in this form for the same time, all but about four of these slides are brand new. Uh, some of them finished up this morning, as a matter of fact, as I continue to put these thoughts together um, on what can help you be an informed consumer of information on antibiotics and uh, things you need to discuss and understand about them. So first of all, we are going to talk about some definitions. And these are used a lot to talk about different antibiotics and different characteristics of them. And of course, as clinical pharmacologists, we live in the area of these two components of designing regimens and talking about what they mean. In the end, it all comes down to how they work out in an actual clinical situation. But the pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug and the pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body or to the bacterial pathogen in the case of antibiotics. And we also have to think about toxicities and adverse reactions, et cetera. So pharmacokinetics is just how we numerically describe how the drug moves through the body. Uh, it's absorbed, it's uh, distributed through the body, and then it's metabolized or just eliminated as the active compound either way. And then pharmacodynamics is a description of how the drug is best exposed to the target. In our case today, that's to the, uh, ant, to the bacteria. Some of it needs to be a real quick high peak, some a long low concentration. And the reality is uh, 
we can make any of those drugs work clinically. And when you're using an approved drug, that's all been worked out. Uh, they've used PKPD to get the approval. Well, it's been part of the approval process more and more in recent years. And that's been thought through. And then that was used to derive what they thought the optimal dose was. And then they did a clinical trial to show efficacy. Uh, so when you're using an approved antibiotic for an approved indication, you know this has been taken care of. There are cases where we have minimal uh, drugs that are approved or we have to go outside the box because maybe some of the improvements aren't effective. That is uh, extra label use and that can only legally be done through a relation relationship with you and your veterinarian. So that's PK and PD. And our next one is we're gonna talk about regimens and the regimen are all these things. So whether or not you consciously think through it. Whenever you apply an antibiotic to an animal, you are thinking through and using all these. You're selecting the drug, you've selected a dose, you are giving it by the approved route of administration or a route, and then there's a duration and a frequency. And things have really changed since I entered veterinary practice in 1987. Uh, we got LA-200, Long-acting oxytetracycline is the pioneer product for a 200 milligram per mil single injection oxytetracycline back right around 1980, somewhere in there. And then we got our second single injection effective antimicrobial in 1992, right when I rolled out of my PhD and that was tilmycosin or mycotil was our second one. And since then, there's been an explosion of single injection antimicrobials, which gives the ability to essentially touch an animal once and still have an effective therapeutic outcome. So we, we really are spoiled by having all those options. And of course, there's still places for daily administered drugs, such as uh, ampicillin trihydrate, you'd know it as polyflex or a penicillin G, uh, that we use. There's some earlier versions of Septia for, uh, you know, uh, XNL, which you would give uh, either every day or every other day. They can still be effective drugs, but, you know, we have to handle the animal repeatedly. So oftentimes, uh, especially in a situation where it's some work to get a hold of the animal, uh, we'll go with those single injection drugs. And of course, the slaughter withdrawal time. Uh, in this group today, we're not going to be talking much about eggs, uh, but and dairies, of course, they're worried about milk withdrawal time. We're always worried about uh, making sure we adhere to the withdrawal time for any administration in food animals. Uh, just a little point of interest today, any, any drug approved in laying chickens has a zero egg withdrawal or it doesn't get approved. So it is zero and they would discard them. So, uh, you know, and one of the reasons I'm learning more and more about eggs and chickens is because a lot more veterinarians that are in mixed practices or even a companion animal practice of around urban areas are dealing with more and more of the backyard chicken movement uh, where people will have them have, you know, minimal experience in husbandry and need a lot of guidance. So an interesting part of the world. Let's talk about pioneer versus generic versus compounded. And there's some confusion in these and some use of terms in a way that aren't appropriate sometimes, but the pioneer product is the original approved version of the formulation. So I, I just gave as an example way back around 1980 when uh, liquamycin LA-200 was approved as the pioneer product for 200 milligram per mil oxytetracycline injections. And today, you know, there's multiple, multiple versions of 200 milligram per mil, uh, you know, you know, biomycin, all, all the generic names that are out there that have been approved, but the Pioneer product is the original one. And that Pioneer product went through all of these eight technical sections. And I just put those in there to impress upon you the extent of effort and review that goes in to approving an FDA approved product. So the CMC there at the top, chemistry manufacturing controls, that's the, uh, the, the way they manufacture the product from the original raw compound, how it's manufactured, clear up to that finished formulation you hold in your hand when you draw out a dose or you take a bolus out of the box. That is all 
approved and it is highly regulated and monitored during the lifespan of that drug. Uh, they have to show it's effective, they have to show it's safe for, and they have to show it's safe for human food safety. And that has evolved a lot in the, in the uh, recent decades. So in 2003, we had uh, guidance for Industry 152 startup that brought out a, a microbial safety component or the ability to, how likely is it to pass a resistant organism through the food chain? Uh, there has to be an environmental impact statement filed and studies done if necessary. They have to approve the label. They have to prepare this freedom of information summary, which summarizes all this for the public. And then there's all the other information. So it's a years, years long process. If you were going to bring a new antibiotic to the food animal sector today, 100 to 200 million dollars, easy. Probably 80 people would be part of the team that brought it to approval. And you're looking at eight to 10 years to get it through. So it's uh, an approved product is really, really uh, a priority to look at and use. And they put a, a lot of effort into those. So a generic product is a generic copy of that approved uh, reference drug, which I'm calling the pioneer product today. So when you buy a generic, it has been approved by the FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine, and it is allowed to be approved using the original label if they can show it is bioequivalent or have that waived. And then they also must meet the stringent uh, manufacturing process requirements. So a generic product is approved by the FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine. The manufacturer of the product is inspected and it must meet specific standards. Uh, it can be a little different than the original depending on how it's approved. So there is some generic misinformation out there, and some of you may have been told this in the past, but I always like to clear this up. You may have been told that a generic product can have as little as 80% of the pioneer product concentration. So if the original is 100 milligrams per mil, that the generic could be as low as 80 milligrams per mil and still be approved, uh, that's completely false. So the next slide here illustrates how this works. So what we've got here is a standard chart and this uh, y-axis is the value for either Cmax, which is the maximum concentration achieved after injection, or area under the curve. So if you draw the curve, we calculate that plasma concentration curve and then the area underneath it. And it's a measure of drug exposure. So we would, let's say we're going to look at uh, Cmax, maximum concentration, and here's the Pioneer product concentration. Let's say it's 100. Now we're going to draw a plus or minus 20% bound around that. So if it's 100, it would be 80 to 120. If we log transform the data, it can be 80 to 125. That is the uh, bounds for the Pioneer product. Now let's inject or administer the generic product, and here's the value for it. You can see in this one that it's pretty close. It's a little different. What's done is we draw a 95% confidence interval, which is a statistical way of saying, here's the average value for these animals. Say we did six animals with the generic product. The average value was 95. But looking at the variation in those animals, we can say we are 95% sure that that value falls between 85 and 105. We're 95% sure that the true mean value of the population is in there. The outer bounds of that confidence interval have to fall within that plus or minus 20 or minus 20 plus 25. So the actual values have to be really, really close. When people refer to that 80%, they're misusing the uh, statistical analysis process. So no, it has to be much, much closer, the actual value than minus 80 or plus 120. That is just the outer bounds of the statistical process. So if you hear that, you can uh, discard that concept. So we've talked about pioneer versus generic, and now let's talk about compounded. A compounded product is not approved by any agency. None of the technical sections that had to be approved by the FDA CBM are completed for that. 
There are no studies to assure efficacy or safety for either the treated animal or for the consumers of the food product from the animal. It's illegal to compound from bulk products which aren't already approved. So if your veterinarian has prepared something for you to administer to an animal that is the result of combining two different approved products and they have the experience that that works and uh, they do that for you and they do it under guidelines from uh, there's guidelines and regulations for doing that perfectly fine. They're prescribing that to you for use because uh, they feel it has met the requirements for preparing a compounded product. Uh, if it was not prepared for ones that were already approved or you go somewhere and buy that outside of that VCPR, then it's an illegal product. But this helps you understand the big differences between the terms pioneer versus generic versus compound. And when you get into a compounded product, uh, you, you're into a whole nother, uh, whole nother set of rules and applications. So when we talk about how we decide if an antibiotic is better than another one, the, the spoiler is it all comes down to clinical efficacy. And for that, we need nice, uh, Prospective means they're designed in the future and done. Randomized, each animal has an equal chance of being in either treatment. Uh, subjective evaluators, like giving scores to the animals, are masked or blinded to which treatment they have. There's all these requirements to do those. Uh, and these factors we're going to talk about here could have a contribution to how the drug acts. But taken alone, any of these that you might hear presented to you as this makes this antibiotic better than any others, uh, taking just one and claiming superiority based on that is something I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't consider valid. And we'll run through those a little bit, just so you understand what they are. And then when someone talks to you about that value for a drug or an antibiotic, you understand, oh, okay, that's what that is. Although it doesn't mean that it's necessarily superior to another one. You may hear about MICs, and this is how we determine susceptible and resistant. So uh, susceptible and resistant, especially resistant organisms in human medicine are a very high priority item right now. There are some in the human population that really cause challenges with us to treat them. There are ones in the veterinary field that also cause challenges for us. In some groups of cattle, we isolate some uh, very broadly resistant uh, Mannheimia hemolytica at times. It doesn't mean it's everywhere, but at times we've encountered those. So this is how we, in the lab, in, under very well-specified conditions, we expose an antibiotic to a pathogen that we've isolated or a test bacteria and we measure at what concentration along a set series of dilutions the growth is first inhibited. And that's the minimal inhibitory concentration. It's nice if it's really low. For example, it only takes 0.06 micrograms of the drug per mil of culture to inhibit the growth of the organism. But we have drugs which might take eight and are still very effective against that pathogen. So low MIC is nice uh, if you're being told to select one drug because the MIC values are lower. Yeah, no, it doesn't necessarily work that way. It's a nice attribute, but we can dose appropriately for a drug with a higher MIC also. This is a term that's thrown around a lot, broad spectrum, and there's absolutely no standardized definition for this. Uh, it's typically used in reference to saying it'll just treat multiple, multiple different diseases and multiple different organisms, but there's no set point where we say it moves from broad to narrow spectrum. And I, I've just got to the point of completely discounting this term, and I do not use it at all. I, I teach our students they're not an appropriate term. Instead, we uh, study the actual spectrum of different groups and of antibiotics and specific antibiotics, and that only applies if we don't have a resistant one. So there's lots of caveats to this, but I would encourage you not to uh, 
think that just because something's called a broad spectrum, it's necessarily better at any disease or not. And in fact, today, broad and narrow spectrum are used in the arena of resistance selection considerations that a narrow spectrum is better in that we don't select for as much resistance in the populations that live in the animal or in the environment. We don't really have any proof of that either because the narrow spectrum is a definition across a very narrow array of bacteria. And it's just uh, broad spectrum and narrow spectrum are ones that you can just kind of let go through one ear and out the other. I, I, don't, I don't use them at all. Then long acting or single injection are two terms that aren't necessarily the same. So we've already talked about that many of the antibiotics we use today are single injection. We give it once and they, uh, we don't treat again unless at the end of what we call the post-treatment interval or how long it is after administration that we evaluate the animal again on whether or not it needs another treatment. That's the post-treatment interval. A lot of times we hang out in that five to seven day range, some may be shorter. That post-treatment interval is a between you and your veterinarian decision point. Uh, they, they work with you to understand how your system works, how you will or won't have access to those animals after being treated. Uh, I can tell you that if you invest in a single injection antimicrobial, Given another one the next day, if they don't look better, is almost always too soon. You need to give them time to work. And we're going to come back to that a little bit later about that you can't, you can't attribute every recovery to the antibiotic. And ones that haven't recovered in 24 hours, you can't necessarily say, well, it's not working. we got to switch to the next one. Uh, you, you determine a post-treatment interval for each of the regimens you use, and you stick to that except in really, really uh, extenuating circumstances. So that post-treatment interval is one of the big things you determine for each one you're using. And the reason for single injection status varies a lot between different ones. Uh, some of them, like the fluoroquinolones, if you've used uh, Batrol or Advacin for respiratory disease, they're single injection because that's the best way the drug works is a single very high peak. And then the drug's gone fairly quickly within like 48 hours, most of the drugs gone, but we still may have a post-treatment interval longer than that. Whereas others like a telathromycin, which you know is Draxin, have a much longer drug exposure time, but then they don't work by maximum concentration. They work by a steady longer exposure. So all that's wrapped up in the regimen that you know to use for an antibiotic and they've been considered and established in that regimen. And they, uh, the regimen your veterinarian would uh, recommend is based on that type of knowledge that's gone into that. Here's another one that's often presented as making one antibiotic better than another, and that's whether it's bactericidal or bacteriostatic. Bactericidal is a measure of how fast it can reduce the number of organisms in a culture where we put so many organisms per mill in a culture, and then we put in a set amount of antimicrobial or antibiotic and let it sit there for 24 hours and then measure the concentration of live bacteria at the end of that. And there's a, a standard for how much it has to decrease it. So CIDL is where the drug stays hooked up long enough and the action is fast enough that the bacteria actually die. In a bacteria static, the drug stays there and inhibits the growth of the organism. It won't continue to replicate and grow and cause more damage. But when the drug concentrations fall away, that bacteria can start to grow again. And I'm not aware of any antibiotic where we can affect a cure for an infectious disease without help from the animal's immune system. Uh, to think that we can go in and kill off every possible pathogen without help from the animal is, is just unrealistic. So all of the antibiotics require some help from the animal. Cidal's nice. Uh, we have a lot of very, very effective uh, antibiotics that we consider to be bacteriostatic. 
uh, against that organism. And in most cases for those bacteria statics, they require that long exposure, either through uh, a, a long uh, period of exposure from a single injection or repeated administrations. But that's all wrapped up in the regimen that's been shown to be effective. So if it's effective, if they're both effective, one being cidal and one being static, doesn't make the cidal necessarily better. And the mechanism of action of antibiotics requires that the antibiotic is, uh, comes in contact with the bacteria. And we do that in laboratories in very controlled environments and evaluate how the antibiotic interacts with that drug. It's probably different in the animal. So you'll hear people say that you can't trust uh, antimicrobial susceptibility testing because it's lab and the interaction occurs in the animal. Well, for one, where efficacy in the animal is taken into account versus what it takes to inhibit the organism, that's not true. It does fit. And susceptibility testing is beyond what we're going to discuss today, but there are applications for it. I don't advocate it's done in every animal, but there certainly are applications where it can guide us in therapy of additional animals after the one we've collected the case from, or in some cases, the animal we're treating. So the mechanism of action is part of what determines the pharmacodynamics and how things work. They work by inhibiting bacterial protein synthesis, interfering with bacterial DNA function, or causing cell wall damage. Uh, all different kinds of modes of action. You know, it's interesting to pharmacology geeks like me to know that and how they work and sometimes it gives us a hint to how they might best be exposed or the best regimen but then the ultimate proof is in clinical efficacy so there's some ways you can fool yourself on your own observations so the thing i think a lot of us pride ourselves on is that we observe what's going on and, and pick up clues as to what goes on with the animals from management practices we apply and that's valid not discounting experience at all. It's a very valuable teacher, but we have to be careful on what we take from the experience. So the improvement of an animal with an infectious disease is based on a really complex interaction of many, many factors. So I imagine no one listening here would give just an antibiotic to a cold calf with the scours. We're gonna address the body temp, we're gonna address dehydration, and we're gonna address electrolyte balance and the acidosis that cast probably experiencing in its bloodstream. And if we don't address those three, the antibiotic is useless. And there are times when uh, certain ages and if you have certain viral pathogens uh, affecting the calves and they're up and running around, there's times when an antibiotic would probably be a very minimal benefit to us. Okay. And there's times when there's a good chance they're septic that they could be a very big benefit to us when complied with the rest of, when applied with the rest of the regimen. So I've developed what I call a confusogram just to illustrate, let me get there and go, just to illustrate how complicated this is. And I think if given some time and you sat down at a whiteboard with a marker, many of you could come up with this same thing because you understand all these different things that are in there. So that the classic interaction is the disease, the animal, and the therapy. And what we're talking about today is how we select that therapy or points that go into selecting it. So if you look at the disease, the disease is heavily affected by the pathogen, the location of the disease, and the progression of the disease at the time we interact. Uh, you've all probably, you know, checked a pasture with a cow with foot rot that's now she's to the club foot stage and we didn't catch her. And you know you're in for a lot longer treatment and maybe a worse outcome than if we would have caught her when she first limped. Uh, so that's just a concrete example of disease progression. A calf with scours or a calf with pneumonia. Uh, if we can catch them right at the outset, outcomes are usually different than if we catch them, uh, you know, where they're down or really severely affected. Then if we look at that animal, the husbandry we apply, the, the way we handle them, the immunity that that animal has either through vaccinations or in the calf, you know, getting adequate colostrum, 
and then the physiological state of the animal if they're in a positive energy balance or in a negative energy balance if they're affected by other diseases you know when for respiratory disease if we have a ibr or a bbd or a brsv blowing through it changes how they're going to uh, succumb to and react to uh, a challenge from a bacteria and then therapy we've got antimicrobials and other things that can or we do or don't use along with the antimicrobial and that's a whole nother uh, discussion as to what we put with them. So that looks pretty complicated, but now let's ramp it up one more step because if we look at the pathogen, we can see that there are factors on how virulent the pathogen is, how aggressive it is in causing disease. And even within the same genera and species, so for example, Mannheimia hemolytica uh, used to be Pastorella hemolytica, which causes pneumonia in calves, we have different isolates with very different levels of virulence, how aggressive they are in causing disease. We have uh, different amounts of inoculum. And so right now, you know, we're very concerned about whether or not we get COVID-19 virus exposure. Uh, it's also the same for salmonella or E. coli or staph and foodborne illness. How much you're exposed with determines whether or not you have disease or not. And then the susceptibility of the pathogen to therapeutic interactions such as antibiotics. And the location, tremendous amount of effect on where that disease is. Out in the lungs, we have uh, effects of different things like proteins that can bind up some antibiotics more than others, how the antibiotic can diffuse to that area, the pH of the area, which can affect the activity of certain drugs, all those things add in that are going on. And then of course, in the uh, progression, you know, are we using diagnostics to pick up some earlier ones? We're seeing advances in that. And then the case definition. So one of the biggest things you can do about appropriately applying antibiotics is your case definition of disease. And that is when you decide you will treat. And so many of us have that in our heads. And if you have multiple people working with a group of cattle, it's really beneficial to put down that case definition. And then also go out when you're having a disease challenge and have all of you pick them out together. And you'll find that there's a wide variety of when we think we need to treat one versus when we don't. And we're gonna talk about treatment success and case fatality here in a minute. And that'll help us figure out uh, some about how our case definition's doing. But that case definition sounds kind of uh, academic or ivory tower, but in reality, it's the basic component of appropriately using antibiotics. And then in our husbandry part, you know, the stress on those animals, the environment they're in and biosecurity, and everyone in here could give their own lecture on what happens when you calve out heifers in a nice grass catch versus a muddy lot and the pneumonia uh, and especially the enteric disease that follows with that. Uh, that's a concrete example of how the environment affects all this. Uh, and that environment relates to the stress put on the animals. When we just ship the animals, what happens? Or uh, co-mingle animals, whatever and how that happens. And of course, the nutrition there, uh, very, very, very important. Uh, the immunity, your vaccine program, the age of the animal when exposed, the genetics of the animal, we're finding more and more that uh, resistance to disease is inherited. Uh, there are some programs in dairy bulls where they get a, a score on uh, the likelihood for their offspring as dairy cows to get mastitis or other diseases. And we're closing in on that and they're closing in on gene markers, which would let us look at different breeding stock on how well they will resist disease. Uh, so there's a whole component there. The physiological state of the animal We've got the acid base status. So back to that scouring calf, if we don't fix the acid base, an antibiotic isn't gonna fix it if they're acidotic. The body temp, the hydration status of the animal, and then the production level, when we're really cranking out uh, growth in some of these animals, you know, keeping up with nutrition, the stress on the animal, it matters. And then all the, components of the antimicrobial. So I've just spent five minutes of your life and a substantial amount of our oxygen laying out this confusogram for the purpose of this arrow right here. 
This arrow is the interaction between the antimicrobial regimen we're going to select and the susceptibility of that pathogen to that regimen. So when we talk about which antimicrobial or antibiotic is going to be best, we're talking about this arrow, this relationship between the regimen and the susceptibility of the pathogen amongst all this. And that's exactly why blanket recommendations for this antibiotic is always the best or this other one is uh, trouble me. I, I think that's uh, it's experiential between you and your veterinarian, between what's going on in the area and what's going on in your uh, facility, your ranch, your farm. But there's also caveats to that. But this just points out the complexity of making that decision and how there's a lot bigger difference for using an antimicrobial than which antimicrobial you use within a group that's reasonable to use. I'll repeat that. There's a lot bigger difference between using or not using an antibiotic as compared to which antibiotic you use among a group that are reasonable to use for that disease. One of the things you'll notice is I'm flipping back and forth between antimicrobial and antibiotic. The, the standard term out there is antibiotic and that it generically applies to everything. Technically an antimicrobial is also includes one that are synthetically produced. So like a, a fluoroquinolone, which is Batril and Advacin or a sulfa drug, those are completely synthetic whereas almost all of our other ones are either a direct fermentation product of another living organism or a modification of that. So don't get hung up on antimicrobial versus antibiotic. The technical term to encompass everything we're talking about is antimicrobial. So if you look in the red there, that's everything that impacts how our therapy turns out. And the yellow has a huge impact on whether or not we have the disease. So we can, when we start talking about communicating with the public and why we use antibiotics, a lot of times we get hung up over here on how we're justified in using that antibiotic and are making judicious choices in using it in relation to that disease. What we may be missing is their question is what goes on over here with stress and biosecurity and environment and the production level that's causing us to have to treat the disease over here. Uh, the two ends of that are, yep, in certain conditions, we're gonna have some foot rot cases uh, out on pasture. Down here in our part of the world, anaplasmosis, pretty big deal, uh, especially late summer on into the fall. Uh, liver abscesses and cattle on feed, totally different deal. Uh, we know exactly why they occur. We know that we have an antibiotic that's very effective in uh, reacting to that and maintaining our performance levels. But the question on the part of others is, why do you have to do that? So that's just pointing out different areas of this in the conversation. So the selection of a regimen requires consideration of all these inputs. So the affected animals and how quickly you're interacting, the practicality of the regimen. We know that there's some that don't syringe as well in cold weather as others. We know there's some that have really high injection volumes versus others, which may be part of the decision process on what we want to use. The disease, and we have some diseases that can have multiple different pathogens with different characteristics and different reactions to different antibiotics. And it takes that type of knowledge of what's specifically going on with your disease challenge to really get in there and lay out which antibiotic makes the most sense. And of course, there's safety. Uh, some antibiotics can have a larger chance of causing us harm than others. And in those cases, you know, we wouldn't, uh, there's some I definitely wouldn't use as a pasture drug where I've got a, a calf stretch between a pole and a horse or two horses and I'm jumping off and administering that antibiotic where there's others that would make more sense in that situation. So there's some ways we can fool ourselves with our observations. Uh, one is this first one of changing horses. 
And that's when we get partway through an outbreak, like a respiratory outbreak. We got caught a little off guard. Some of them may be a little further along in their disease process. We jump in and we switch drugs. We're probably looking at a different population of animals that we're treating in the latter half of that outbreak than in the first. We're more on it. We're catching them earlier. Uh, the outbreak is slowing down. So to compare the success of the one later to the success of the one earlier, is probably not an accurate comparison. And then historical controls is when we did something last year and we change it to this year. That can get us into a lot of problems. Uh, if we just attribute it all to one thing we change between year to year, there's just too many changes. It doesn't mean that you can't make observations and kind of put those in your think tank, but be very, very, very careful about attributing changes in those situations to just one management change, especially if it's an antibiotic. And then not every animal that recovers can be chalked up to the antibiotic. And one of our most well-described treatment outcome scenarios is all of the high-risk calf BRD studies done for approval of a lot of these antibiotics. And we can go back and calculate some something is called the number needed to treat. And that's how many animals you have to treat to make a difference in one. And in the case of very high risk calves, which may or may not apply to your situation, we have to treat two for bovine respiratory disease with our frontline drugs in order to change the treatment outcome to one. So if we treat four calves, one might be a failure regardless of whether we treat them. One is gonna be a, a uh, success regardless if we treat them and two we're going to change whether or not they're still sick in say five days or not by whether or not we treat them so we have some spontaneous recoveries and we have some that just aren't yet ready to recover regardless of what we do and then for mortality in those same studies every seventh animal we treated that was identified as respiratory disease and treated as a median value we prevented a mortality. So we treat two to make a difference in treatment outcome with one, whether or not they continue to have the disease, and we treat seven to prevent one from dying. Uh, pretty effective. Those are pretty amazing numbers. Uh, a number needed to treat of two is amazing. A number needed to treat of one is where we actually make a difference with the drug in every case we treat, which is incredibly rare. So there, our drugs we have are very, very, very effective, and again, Amongst reasonable selections for that disease, the difference between using and not using an antibody and probably how soon you intervene is a much bigger difference than which antibiotic you pick. I'm not saying that there's not cases where antibiotic choice makes a difference, but the biggest concerns are getting in early, getting an effective antibiotic in them when it's required, and then doing everything we can to avoid having to do that again. Well, I mentioned treatment success and case fatality. Treatment success is how many, what percentage of the ones you treated, you never have to treat again. And in those high risk BRD calf studies, you look at 60 to 80%. You can see lower than that, you can see higher than that, but we'd hope that for true pneumonia, maybe 60 to 80% of them, we don't have to treat again. Case fatality is how many of those that we treated that die. So if I had 10 deaths after going through a respiratory outbreak, which is catastrophic, and I treated 100, I had a 10% case fatality rate. And I use those a lot to evaluate how things are going. And one of the ways things I look at, if you have a 95% treatment success rate and a 0% case fatality, we start asking if you're treating more than you need to treat that the way to have almost zero of either is or, you know, a com the highest treatment success and the lowest case fatality you could have is to just treat everybody for the disease, which sometimes we do when we treat for control of BRD, for example. And then we usually then cut our morbidity in half. That's the rule of thumb. If we're having a serious outbreak break and these numbers come from high risk calves and we wait in and treat everyone, we basically cut our numbers in half. And so those are all uh, affected by a lot of different things.
So I want to give some time for questions. Uh, so I'll just close up with, is antibiotic resistance real? And the answer is yes, it absolutely is real. Is it everywhere? Is it affecting every, every uh, treatment we apply? No, it isn't. Can it in some cases? Yes. Uh, is antimicrobial use in food animals a major cause of resistance in human disease? The answer is no. Is it, can it be a part of some diseases? The answer is yes, definitely yes. Uh, drug resistant salmonella can travel through the food chain. Does it do it all the time? No. Can it? Yes. Uh, is vancomycin resistant enterococci, methicillin resistant staph aureus, carbapenem resistant klebsiella on the human side? Are those responsible? Or are we responsible for those? In my opinion, absolutely not. Uh, but resistance is real and we do need to pay attention to uh, to some of the things that are going on and i'm going to jump to this i had a couple of word slides there but uh, this is what i want to share with you where how we work antibiotics into a reasonable stewardship system and stewardship is the term we're using for properly applying antibiotics and it is truly a veterinarian producer partnership uh, there's there's no way either one does it alone. It, it takes both, and it starts out with the responsibility for appropriate diagnostics when necessary. It doesn't mean you have to do it every time. And then an establishment of an accurate and functional case definition. And I've mentioned it before, but if you're going to put a drug in an animal, you need a case definition for why you're doing it. Uh, for respiratory disease, we may use depression scores. You may have a rectal temperature cutoff. You may have other indications, uh, failure to come up to the bunk with others and looking depressed. You know, whatever it is, let's put it down so everyone understands what we're using. And then once you've met that functional case definition, now you enter a cycle where we ask, is there a non-antibiotic alternative which will appropriately prevent, control, or treat this disease challenge. And one of the examples, again, are those scouring calves. You all know that there's differences in severity. Uh, you know when they get that look, right, that they're not going to stay up, they're going to go down uh, when you need to interview there. And we know it's a completely different case when we've got a calf flat out on its side versus one that you have to chase down to get some electrolytes to, right? So. You're experts at that, of recognizing those differences in the calves, uh, making that decision on when an antibiotic is necessary rather than let's just do it whenever we grab them. That's something we're being asked to do. And then when we do say we need an antibiotic, select one that's safe and effective for that purpose. For each of these diseases, there's a selection of reasonable ones to use. There's a selection of completely unreasonable ones to use. For example, extra label use of genomycin today in a calf with respiratory disease, entirely unreasonable and unmerited. We're putting a prolonged withdrawal time in them in the face of having 12 to 15 other approved antibiotics. The vast majority of those would work fine. So there's an example of one that's just never merited. Uh, genomycin for foot rot, yep, never merited. It doesn't work on anaerobes. You put a long withdrawal time in them. There's some extreme examples like that. Then there's, there's decisions that are made on where resistance may or may not be, and those other things, cost, regimen, practicality, including injection volume, cold weather, syringability, uh, how often you have to catch the animal, all those things come in, and you're the experts at working with the vet on doing that. We want to assure that it's used, it's shown to be safe and effective, and then is the antibiotic intervention still necessary? That's a really tough question for uh, deciding whether or not we continue to use an antimicrobial or antibiotic intervention that we've used for years. You know, we're gonna, at weaning, we put them on this or that in the feed. Well, is that still necessary? Is that still necessary this year? And uh, besides cost, today I'm aware of the potential, could we be selecting for a resistant subpopulation of enteric, you know, scourge pathogens or respiratory pathogens. I don't know, but the easiest way to not do that is not use a regimen that isn't necessary. And then stop, yes, or 
uh, circle back through with the same thing. So that's a that's a quick run through of things I consider and think about, and some common misconceptions or place where we can, places we can trip ourselves up in that veterinary producer partnership in selecting antimicrobial regimens and setting up case definitions for when we do or don't need them. And just as important as figuring out when we don't need them, which is uh, sometimes tough. Thank you, so Dr. Youngquist. I'd take any questions if there are some. Thank you. Um, we have a few folks here. Maybe have some questions. We really are in no hurry this morning. So if people have questions or want to either come up here and ask them or tell me and I can ask them for you. If you'd like to, if, if, otherwise I'll have to repeat it for you. So come up here and he can hear you from several feet away. So in fact, we could actually do even do this way. I think then he could even see you if you want. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, as we, as we look at uh, doctor and cattle in, in Wyoming, we're in large areas and it seems that in a lot of our areas, the cattle are like in the fall or late summer and we are doctoring uh, for pneumonia or possibly a foot rot bull or a foot rot cow. And some of us have gone to dart guns to save labor, it's quicker. Uh, we might be five miles away from our horses or something to daughter, it's safer. But if we were to daughter, a, a, let's say a 1800 pound bull, in our own operation, I haven't found an antibiotic that we could use in one shot. And you, you're not gonna be able to shoot those animals two or three times. Are they coming up with an antibiotic that, that we could use that is effective and safe for animals as well as humans? Right. It, uh, one of the things I don't want flying around in a dart is till my cousin course, uh, for safety for us. Uh, then I'm not aware of another one that's even more concentrated. When you get up, uh, you know, we've got some that are 200 and 300 milligram per mil with a, with a pretty low injection volume. And I'm not aware of stuff coming out even more concentrated uh, to help you there, but fully realize that that is a challenge of once you get the first one in them, if you get the second one in them, you're a genius. And that's, that's tough. But I don't know of any that are coming up that are even more concentrated. And uh, uh, I don't know, that we, I don't think we could concentrate them even more. So yeah, uh, that is recognized. I'm sure the companies understand that, that, you know, even more concentrated version is there. There might be uh, there might be some in development that I just don't know about. Okay, thank you. If anybody who's participating virtually would like to unmute themselves and ask questions, you're welcome to do that. Or come on up, man. Dr. Apley, appreciate the talk. It was very good information. Uh, I guess I have a couple questions. One, uh, in the in your Kansas area there, are you guys seeing any resistance issues with any of your drugs? Um, you definitely have a higher concentration of feedlots than we would ever think of here in Wyoming. But uh, so I'm just curious if there are some drugs out there that you guys just are finding uh, to be um, useless in, in treating whether it's foot rot or respiratory diseases. Okay, uh, so for foot rot, we don't typically do those anaerobic organisms, so aren't really sure of, of what might be out there for resistance. Uh, not really receiving reports of resistance. When we do see foot rots non, not responding in feedlot situations, a lot of times that is a hairy heel wart that's come in, you know, especially where we fed some Holsteins, but we're seeing it in colored cattle too. And in those cases, what you'll see is that it's just completely non-responsive to an injectable oxytetracycline. 
topical tetracyclines are very commonly used for hairy heel wart, but an injectable just won't touch it. And so if you run into something like that in a confinement situation, uh, you know, that and that hairy heel wart can have a pretty different look to it. Uh, as far as bovine respiratory disease pathogens, we we're kind of coming back down, but when we look at uh, our occurrence rate, the highest one we get in diagnostic lab isolates is Mannheimia hemolytica. We see a little in Pasteurella multocida, but not much. Estophilus somni, a little resistance, but it's primarily Mannheimia hemolytica. And when they go back out into the same groups and try to pull it out of nasal swabs or, you know, it's not, it doesn't seem to go through all of them. Uh, there's something out there circulating called an integrated conjugative element or ice that is a piece of genetics that can slip back and forth between all three of our primary respiratory pathogens as well as E. coli in the lab. Not sure how much it does that out there in the real world, but that transfers resistance to, well, it doesn't transfer resistance to septiafer, so exceed or XNL, there isn't a resistance gene on there against those. And the resistance gene to fluorophenicol or new fluor is plus minus, but it typically encodes for resistance across all of our macrolides, which would be uh, Zactran, Zuprevo, uh, uh, Draxin, and Mycotil as well as the penicillin, sulfas, and those. And what they find, a study from the Iowa State Diagnostic Lab, is that the more times the animal was treated before it died and the sample was sent in, the more likely they are to have that resistant characteristic in them. So by the time you get up to uh, uh, three treatments, you know, almost all the, well, 80% of the isolates with three treatments are coming in. We were up to a point where you know, we had 40, 50% of the isolates come to the diagnostic lab displaying this type of resistance. It's eased off some, but keep in mind that that population of bacteria we're testing are from the worst of the worst where someone said, we need to send in samples. And it isn't representative that it's out across the entire group, the entire population. We have seen it very early after arrival in some backgrounding calf groups where the only explanation can be that it came from the farm of origin so that these could be out there on the farm of origin but as far as widespread in cow herds or calves weaned on the home ranch uh, a, a different situation a lot of these we're seeing would come from you know backgrounded long haul co-mingled type of cattle so uh, one thing that um, I've heard in our community is, uh, you know, as Draxon came out um, and people were concerned about resistance, uh, the, the word out there was if, if you had a certain situation where you weren't going to be able to retreat the animal or he wasn't handy, let's go with our, our big gun Draxon out there. If they are handy in a feedlot and we can get to them easily, um, then let's let's just use something else, uh, a, a Batril or a LA or something like that. But what I'm hearing, if if I'm hearing, hearing it right, is if you have a severe case, uh, which we would normally, and, and if the cases were severe, then you would want to treat it with Draxin. That's kind of the, the thought. But what I'm hearing today is that those severe cases, uh, because Draxin is longer lasting and maybe slower re reacting or whatever, maybe we are better in those severe cases to be treating with Batril and, and then coming back in with something else later just to get some efficacy right away? Um, that's, that's actually a really, really good question. And the reason is, is the fact it, we're assuming that because it's longer acting, it's a lot slower to get there. It still achieves therapeutic concentrations really fast. Like it's uh, definitely within 12 hours and we're probably almost all the way there within six. So even though it's slower acting, uh, and that's a great question. Uh, and I usually in uh, some other talks do that all the time. Even though some of those have a real long presence, 
they still get there pretty quick. So I, I would not take the fact that they have a long presence as saying that they don't quick get quick there quick enough for you. Okay. So I'd be, I'd be completely comfortable putting one of those long, any of the macrolides which have that long presence in a severe animal and, and not worry that it's going to take, you know, like a day to get there or something. It'll, it'll get there quick. Okay. And then uh, what, what's your experience or thoughts on transdermal banding? Uh, it looks as far as an antipyretic, it's just as effective in dropping fever. And, you know, I, I am very appreciative to them for getting the first drug approved in the United States labeled for a pain indication in food animals. Uh, this is the first one we've got. And what they did was they did a, a foot rot, induced foot rot study and had a model where they could uh, look at how the cattle were walking and measure pain. And they showed that they dramatically reduced that pain. And so that's power to them, much appreciated. There's like eight drugs approved for uh, pain in food animals in the United Kingdom. And we just got our first one because it's been hard to get that model. So it's been shown uh, to drop temp just as quick and in some studies and also uh, be effective for that pain for foot rot, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You bet, thanks for the questions, those are good ones. Does any, anybody online, anybody virtually have any questions? This is a great opportunity if you do. Hi, um, thank you. It was really, I learned a lot today. Um, my question was on compound product definition because maybe I haven't been in the industry as long to hear that, but I wasn't sure, like, could you give an example of that? Because I wasn't quite hundred percent on what the definition of that was. Cause to me that sounded like, okay, so we gave her a shot of penicillin and a shot of LA or like something like that, but I don't think that's, I'm not quite getting it right. So. Yeah. So good question. And if you were to administer, uh, if you were to mix together the penicillin and the LA, that would be a compounded product. Okay. That you're now administering together. Or if your veterinarian says for this animal, we can give these together in one injection and instead of doing multiple sites, I'm going to mix them together for you. That's compounding. And when your veterinarian uses a bottle of this and a bottle of that to put together and in their experience they work together you get the efficacy and they don't crystallize or whatever uh, they can do that there's a there's a, a law the animal medicinal drug use clarification act and regulations which allows them to do that with that relationship with you where we get over the line is sometimes around the country you'll run into a product that someone's created themselves and they've bought what's called a bulk compound and got it through uh, a lot of these drugs may be uh, made in China. And we have a lot of, uh, of the original substance for production, for producing an approved product made in China. There are uh, companies over there that are FDA inspected. They met the requirements. The FDA goes over and inspects them. They do all that. It's shipped to the U.S. and a company receives that and makes the final approved product completely legal, all inspected, high quality. There are other cases where someone might find a way to buy the bulk compound or buy uh, another version of it that's not approved for use. And then they just go ahead and mix it up and they sell it. And you can see these nationally marketed for multiple species from compounding pharmacies. And in those cases, I just want to emphasize that they're not the same as a generic where they haven't gone through those eight technical sections and they, their manufacturing isn't inspected by the FDA. They can say whatever they want about the production, but they're not FDA inspected for the actual day-to-day -day production. And they have not given substantial proof of efficacy. And in some cases, there's some products for horses that have been looked at where they, after about six months, the drug's essentially gone. 
okay. it, it isn't there. So uh, that's the thing about compounding uh, that I just want uh, people to be aware of that there's different levels. And uh, you can also buy compounded products online from some of these compounding pharmacies. Uh, one of the biggest things to do is just ask a veterinarian about that compounded product. Uh, in some cases, it can be necessary and effective. In some cases, they're just trying to sell an unapproved product. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep, good question. Anybody else got any questions about traveling while we've got it? Last call for questions? I don't think anybody else. Can, can, there's a request to talk a little bit about more about Harry Heelwort. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, hairy heel wart is a disease that's very uh, prevalent in the dairy industry and it's caused by uh, a treponema. And I wonder if I can real quick here, uh, yes, I can. Here's what I'm gonna do. If you bear with me just a second, I'm going to jump here, open up, and I'm gonna go back to- uh, Dr. Rafferty, we have plenty of time. Okay, good. We have questions and discussion. We're not in a hurry. Okay, I am going to go back to presentations 20, ABP, New Graduates Conference, feedlot lameness. Uh, da, 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 da. And I will show you. Here we go. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to share screen. PowerPoint slideshow, share. So you should be seeing a uh, uh, heifer there with her left, uh, doing what we call toe standing on her left rear. Yes, you can see it. And this was a feedlot outbreak of hairy heel ward. And here's another one affected on the left front. It almost looks like they're doing the moonwalk where you walk backwards but they're so painful on the heel that they're standing on the toe. And this was a feedlot with about 16,000 head on site. And we had about 300 cases before it ended. And we ended up with one in about every pin. Treponema is a spirochete organism that is commonly, commonly lives in the rumen. And it is ubiquitous. It's everywhere in the environment and it can't really cause foot rot by itself. It needs other organisms with it. I mean, hairy heel work. And so here's uh, a look at the back of the heels and they erode on the heels and it starts to slough away. Here's another picture. You can imagine how painful that is. Uh, typically treated with a topical administration uh, where you put on a tetracycline paste and then you uh, cover it up and put some gauze on it and duct tape it and leave it on until the duct tape falls off. Or sometimes they spray them. Uh, sometimes we can get some injectable antibiotic efficacy, but it's usually you have to treat them this way. Now, this one illustrates why it's called strawberry foot rot or hairy heel wart. So you see these elongated hairs growing out to the left there from the lesion. That's why it's called hairy heel wart. And that looks like a strawberry. And that's uh, why it's called, also called strawberry foot rot. And again, uh, here's underneath, so it can erode up to the front. And where in classic foot rot, you see, you clean it up and you've got kind of an erosion right there in between the claws and it works up in there. This is just raw and uh, it'll come up to the front and you can, you can understand why it'd be so painful. And I've got, uh, I'm going to over here, scroll here and see what I've got for more. Whereas for a classic foot rot, you would see, uh, and I'm going to shut the slideshow off here for a second. And I'm going to pop on this one here. Okay, they stopped sharing. I'll pop back on here in a second. You know, with a classic foot rot. Now I'm going to share screen again. Whereas a classic foot rot, you've got more of this type of erosion when you clean it up. It's working up there in the skin between the claws. 
and you don't have that just ulcerative erosion type approach. And we we heard, you know, some people were calling that super foot rot at the start, the hairy heel wart. But what it is, is it's a different organism. It's another disease approach and they can get affected again in, uh, in like six months or so. And there's all different stages of it. Uh, we'll use foot baths. Foot baths have been used to try to address it in feedlots. It, the foot baths foul pretty quickly. And so you have to recharge them a lot. But in some of the confinement feeding operations up in, uh, oh, we've got some in Kansas here in the Northeast with the big monoslope barns. Uh, some of them are, and you get on up into Iowa, Minnesota, uh, you start to run into these that are uh, Illinois, Ohio, that are either concrete slat floor, some of them with rubber padding or bedding pack. You can get some of those, get the, uh, a hairy heel wart or a foot rot started where they just have to run them through a foot bath about every 90 days when that gets started. So that's what the hairy heel wart is. I hope you never, ever see it up there. It is uh, a pain to deal with uh, when we do get it and uh, kind of sporadic in the feedlots. Thank you. I, I don't, I suspected we might have some, but looking at those pictures, I, I don't think that's where it was, but um, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, foot rot and diphtheria? Um, we had some calves that came out of some, uh, some heifers last year that had some foot rot issues prior to calving. And we were feeding them on the ground after they had calved. And we ended up with some diphtheria cases in the calves. It, isn't there a relationship there? They're, they're the same organism, Fusobacterium necrophorum. Um, and to get foot rot started, you know, they need something scarifying, you know, disrupting that skin between the claws usually, or it, if, as you well know, when it's really wet, or especially when you get ice and they're breaking through ice and it's wet and they're scratching that up or really pointed frozen earth. Uh, and then usually with, uh, to get diphtheria, it needs some type of initial irritation, but yeah, it's the same organism. Fusobacterium necrophorum, an anaerobic organism. Uh, just like foot rot, diphtheria, if caught when they just first start breathing funny, we can get some pretty nice dramatic results for treatment. If they've gone a little bit, what it is, is it's an inflammation right up there in the, uh, in what's their voice box essentially their retinoid cartilages. And once those get inflamed and the scar tissue gets stopped, uh, started there, we can have a, we can knock out the bacteria, but the tissue damage is still there and can take a long, long time to heal up. But yeah, same organism. Okay. That's the first time I've heard that about following. It's probably something that happens. I'm just not aware of But That's interesting. Ours were, uh, they were ulcering inside their cheek there. Um, and, and isn't that kind of a, uh, in, it happens in younger calves, more like that, more so than the inflammation of the voice box? Well, if they're ulcering inside the cheek, to me, that'd be different than diphtheria. Did you, did you actually culture them any, or you oh. just noticed that afterwards? Because, the Fusobacterium necrophorum infection usually with diphtheria is in those cartilages, but out in the cheek or something there, I would speculate it's a different disease process, but of course I didn't, you know, didn't see them. Thank you. Hi there, Dr. Atley. Uh, I had a question for you. In terms of cows going into their third trimester, and sloughing calves. Um, is there anything that can be done? Is there a marker that you can look for in a cow that is going to eventually do that? That, that would predict that they were going to do that? Yeah. It, do they carry that in their blood? Is that a... Yeah. Well, I tell you, the uh, you're talking to someone who's definitely not a theriogenology expert. Uh, the biggest thing for that, those third trimester drops would be uh, 
you know, placenta and fetus for diagnoses. And then, uh, yeah, that's, that's a question for you and your local vet. I, I'm not aware of any marker you could check uh, that would tell you exactly what's going on there. And I'm rusty enough on exactly the the predominant causes of third trimester abortions. I'd leave that leave that to another veterinarian to tackle that one. But it's a great question. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thanks for taking the extra time to answer all these questions. Oh shoot! Now, now, now I wish I would have driven up. It looks like a fun bunch. We could have had lunch. We could next time. We'll bring you up next time. Yeah. Talk uh, thank about. You. Um, thank you very much. And 